ever wondered how some of the smallest organs in your body wield, well, truly enormous power, controlling vital functions that keep everything running smoothly? We're going to explore the critical roles of the adrenal glands first, then we'll pivot to uh, a really complex condition tied to them and the parathyroid glands. Our mission today is basically to unpack the intricate jobs these small but mighty organs perform. You know, what happens when their delicate balance gets disrupted and the um, complex medical decisions involved in treating these conditions? We're primarily focusing on excerpts from a document you provided, adri.pdf, which gives us a great roadmap through this, well, fascinating medical landscape. It really is fascinating. And what we'll be extracting for you today is just how deeply interconnected these physiological systems are. It's quite profound, actually. It really demonstrates the body's hidden feedback loops. How a problem in one seemingly isolated area, like the kidneys, can trigger this whole cascade of issues, right. affecting other crucial glands in ways you might not expect. So we'll guide you from the uh, basic anatomy right through the specifics of diagnosis and treatment, making sure you gain a thorough but still accessible understanding of these complex interactions. Okay, perfect. Let's unpack this then, starting with the adrenal glands themselves. The information you shared describes them as uh, small yellowish organs, shaped a bit like tiny hats, right? Neatly situated, just superior to, or basically right on top of your kidneys. Small, yeah, but they're definitely doing some heavy lifting. Oh, absolutely, indeed. Functionally, each adrenal gland is actually made up of two distinct layers, each with its own crucial job. You've got an outer adrenal cortex, that's essentially the gland's outer shell, and then an inner adrenal medulla, which forms its core. And if we connect this to the bigger picture, these two parts are responsible for producing this wide array of hormones, hormones that are absolutely critical for our survival and well-being. The cortex, for instance, it secretes a class of steroid hormones. These include cortisol, often called the stress hormone, you know. It manages how our body uses fat, protein, carbohydrates, aldosterone too, which is vital for regulating blood pressure, and also androgens, which are precursor sex hormones. Wow. Okay. So a lot going on just in that outer layer. What about the inner part, the medulla? Right, the medulla. That's more like our body's rapid response team. It produces catecholamines. These are powerful neurotransmitters and hormones like epinephrine and nor norepinephrine, you know, the fight or flight hormones we always hear about. Ah, uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. Exactly. They prepare your body for immediate action, increasing heart rate, blood flow to muscles that sort of thing. It's quite astonishing, really, when you realize just how central these tiny glands are. So thinking about our everyday health, what are the most vital functions these adrenal hormones are orchestrating? The ones we'd immediately notice if they went, well, haywire. Well, they're absolutely critical for key body functions, like regulating metabolism, maintaining stable blood pressure, and crucially, orchestrating our body's precise response to physical and emotional stress. They're also highly efficient. They have a rich blood supply, which ensures their hormones are rapidly secreted right into circulation when needed. And their output can be precisely controlled, either by other hormones or the nervous system. It really highlights their role as um, essential command centers. Yeah, It's just a testament to the body's intricate design that such small structures can have such a widespread fundamental impact on our ability to function day to day. Okay, so the adrenal glands are fascinating on their own. But the true deep dive in the material you've shared really begins as we pivot. We pivot to how their neighbors, the kidneys, can profoundly impact other critical endocrine glands. And one of the most significant insights from your document is the prevalence of secondary hyperparathyroidism, or SHPT. It's described as a really common and significant complication, particularly for patients dealing with chronic kidney disease, or CKD. Right, and this raises a really important question, why does kidney disease lead to problems with the parathyroid glands? It seems almost counterintuitive, doesn't it? It does. Your kidneys, mainly known for filtering waste, maintaining fluid balance, how do they trigger a crisis in tiny glands in your neck that manage calcium? Well, SHPT is characterized by an excessive secretion of parathyroid hormone, PTH, from these parathyroid glands. And the data we've reviewed is quite striking. SHPT affects nearly all patients undergoing long-term hemodialysis for end-stage renal disease, ESRD. Nearly all. Wow. Yes. Specifically, we're talking five out of six, that's 83% of these patients experiencing SHPT. And the median diagnosis time is just 2.5 years after starting hemodialysis. It's a, it's a profound demonstration of those hidden feedback loops you mentioned. One system's distress call just reverberates throughout the entire endocrine orchestra. That prevalence is truly alarming, 83%. And it sounds like it's a problem that often just gets worse as the kidney disease progresses. That's right. 
The sources mention that even pre-dialysis patients can show elevated PTH and disturbed calcium phosphate metabolism, even with only slightly elevated serum creatinine levels, which indicates the problem starts much earlier than end-stage disease. Okay, so at a fundamental level, what's actually causing this? What's the, um, the pathophysiology? How does it happen step by step? The pathophysiology, how the disease develops, it's multifactorial, not just one single cause. Right, so not just one thing going wrong. What are the main drivers then? The primary drivers are phosphate retention and the impaired renal activation of vitamin D. Both are direct consequences of the failing kidneys. See, healthy kidneys normally filter out excess phosphate. They're also essential for converting inactive vitamin D into its active form, which our body needs. Yeah. When the kidneys fail, these processes go wrong. Phosphate builds up and you don't get enough active vitamin D. This combination leads to hypocalcemia, critically low calcium levels in the blood. Ah, okay. Low calcium. Exactly. And in response, the parathyroid glands, whose main job is to regulate calcium and phosphate homeostasis, basically keeping those minerals balanced, they kick into overdrive. They're trying desperately to raise the calcium levels. So the parathyroid glands are actually doing what they're supposed to do, just in an extreme situation caused by the kidneys. Precisely. They're responding to what they perceive as an emergency signal, low calcium. But over time, this constant chronic overstimulation causes the parathyroid glands to enlarge. It's a process called hyperplasia. Hyperplasia, meaning the cells multiply? Correct. The cells multiply, making the glands abnormally big. And once they become hyperplastic like that, they start secreting TTH autonomously, excessively. Yeah. Even when calcium levels might later return to normal or even get high, they just keep pumping out PTH. Out of control. Exactly. And this dysregulation leads to various clinical disorders. It can result in really severe clinical manifestations across multiple body systems. So it's this complex, often devastating chain reaction. Failing kidneys disrupt calcium and phosphate, forcing the parathyroids into overdrive, and then they just go rogue. When you connect those dots, it paints a very clear and frankly quite alarming picture of how linked our internal systems are. What kind of impact does this have on someone's daily life then? What are the key symptoms mentioned in the documents? The symptoms of hyperparathyroidism, as detailed in your material, can be quite debilitating. They really impact quality of life significantly. Things like chronic bone pain, a deep, persistent ache that can be just relentless, joint pain too, generalized weakness and severe itching, which is known as pruritus. That can be incredibly uncomfortable, often maddeningly relentless. That sounds awful. It is. And one of the most severe complications mentioned is something called calciphylaxis. That's where calcium actually deposits in small blood vessels, leading to painful skin lesions and tissue necrosis, literally tissue death because the blood flow is blocked. Oh, wow. And this makes perfect sense when you consider PTH's primary role in bone turnover. Excessive PTH pulls far too much calcium out of the bones. This causes significant skeletal issues, making bones weak, brittle, prone to fractures. It's really a cascade of suffering that stems from this initial kidney-driven imbalance. Given how severe SHPT can become and how debilitating those symptoms sound, the pain, the itching, calciphylaxis, your sources discuss a surgical option, parathyroidectomy. This sounds like a pretty significant step, maybe a last resort. What are the key indications, the criteria that typically lead to this surgery? Yes, it's definitely a significant step. The primary indication, as your document clearly states, is severe SHPT, that is refractory to medical therapy. Yeah. That means standard treatments aren't working anymore. Things like uh, medications to lower phosphate, active vitamin D supplements, or drugs called calcium-sensing receptor agonists, they're just no longer effective. The disease keeps progressing despite them. Okay, so medicine isn't cutting it. Right. And the sources give very specific criteria for when surgery might be considered. These include persistently elevated PTH levels, and we're talking incredibly high levels here, often more than nine times the upper limit of normal. It's a clear signal the parathyroid glands are way beyond regulating calcium properly and are now actually causing significant harm. So it's not just a little high, it's dangerously high. Mm -hmm. What else flags the need for surgery? Makes doctors say, okay, it's time. Exactly. Dangerously high. Other criteria include those ongoing debilitating symptoms we talked about, the chronic bone pain, the severe pruritus, despite trying all the medical management options. Also, hypercalcemia, meaning high calcium, or hyperphosphatemia, high phosphate, that just remains 
uncontrolled even with medication. Progressive enlargement of the parathyroid glands that you can actually see on imaging, like an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And serious bone complications. Things like intractable bone disease, pathological fractures, bones breaking with minimal trauma, or even tendon ruptures. These indicate significant skeletal damage. And of course, the presence of calciphylaxis is a very strong indication, often an emergency. Or in very rare instances, if there's a suspicion of parathyroid carcinoma, cancer, that also necessitates surgery. That's incredibly specific. Which, I suppose, makes sense for such a major intervention. It underscores the gravity. Does the document discuss how these criteria evolved? Or maybe any ongoing debates about, you know, the exact timing for surgery? The document implies these criteria have been refined over time based on clinical experience and outcomes research, though it doesn't really delve into historical debate specifically. It more emphasizes that these are now pretty clear benchmarks. They indicate that the potential benefits of surgery likely outweigh the inherent risks once these thresholds are met. Right. But as you say, with any surgery, there are always potential risks and complications. What should someone understand about the potential downsides of a parathyroidectomy? Absolutely. That's crucial. The documents outline several important complications. A particularly highlighted risk is injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, the RLN, apparently because it runs so close to the parathyroid glands in the neck. Precisely. Its proximity is the issue. Okay, let's unpack that specific risk. What exactly happens if the RLN gets injured during the surgery? What does it mean for the patient? Well, injury to the RLN can lead to vocal cord paralysis on that side. This typically manifests as hoarseness or dysphonia, which is just difficulty speaking, maybe a weak or breathy voice. And in severe cases, though rarer, if both nerves were affected, it could even lead to airway compromise, which can be very serious, potentially needing intervention. Okay, so impacting the voice is the main thing. Mostly, yes. And while the incidence of permanent RLN injury is actually quite low, typically between 0.5% and 2%, maybe one or two out of every 100 surgeries, temporary injury is more common. It affects maybe 3% to 10% of patients, so up to 1 in 10 might have temporary hoarseness that usually resolves. I see. Surgeons doing this need to be intimately familiar with the nerve's anatomy, which can vary a bit. And techniques like intraoperative nerve monitoring are often used now. Little probes that help identify and hopefully preserve the nerve during the operation. Yeah. Risk factors for injury include things like a very large gland size, needing a reoperation if there was previous neck surgery, significant inflammation in the area, and unfortunately, parathyroid carcinoma invading nearby structures. It really sounds like a delicate balance, doesn't it? Treating one serious condition without inadvertently creating another. What are some of the other complications mentioned that listeners should be aware of? beyond the nerve injury risk. Sure. Other key complications include hypocalcemia, low blood calcium. This is actually a common, almost expected occurrence right after the operation. Why is that? Well, because the glands that were massively overproducing PTH are suddenly removed. The body, especially the bones, which were used to that high PTH signal, can sort of soak up calcium for a while. It's sometimes called hungry bone syndrome. So PTH levels drop abruptly and calcium follows. Patients typically need significant calcium and active vitamin D supplementation, sometimes intravenously at first, to manage this in the short term until things stabilize. Right, the body has to readjust. Exactly. Then there are the general surgical risks you have with any procedure, things like hemorrhage, bleeding, or infection at the surgical site. And furthermore, there's always a possibility of persistent or recurrent SHPT. This can happen if not all the hyperplastic parathyroid tissue. Usually there are four glands, sometimes more, sometimes in unusual locations, if not all of it is successfully identified and removed during the initial surgery. Or if some remaining gland tissue eventually becomes hyperactive again down the line. So it might not be a permanent fix in every single case. It's usually very effective, but recurrence is possible. Despite these risks, though, the primary goals of parathyroidectomy are really clear. To significantly alleviate those debilitating symptoms, the pain, the itching, to prevent the progression of severe bone disease and its complications, and ultimately to vastly improve the patient's quality of life, which, as we heard, is often severely compromised by uncontrolled SHPT. Okay, so let's try and pull this all together. What does this all mean for us, having explored these really intricate details? We've gone from the uh, foundational understanding of the adrenal glands, recognizing their wide-ranging control over stress, blood pressure, metabolism, to the complex and honestly quite devastating development of secondary hyperparathyroidism and chronic kidney disease. And then 
right into the very specific medical criteria and surgical considerations for treating this condition, including the risks involved. I think this deep dive truly emphasizes just how finely tuned our body systems are and how profoundly interconnected. It really shows how a seemingly isolated issue like kidney disease can cascade, create these profound effects on other vital endocrine glands like the parathyroids. Understanding conditions like SHBT, you know, from its striking prevalence in dialysis patients to the 83% figure is really stark. To the detailed criteria for surgical intervention and the potential risks like RLN injury, it offers a much clearer, more holistic picture. A picture of both the challenges and the sophisticated solutions available in modern medicine. It really highlights the body's delicate balancing act and what happens when that balance gets catastrophically disrupted. Absolutely. So for you, our listener, this journey through the ADRI.pdf sources hopefully provides a robust and uh, deeply insightful foundation on this topic and perhaps leaves you with a provocative thought to mull over, something like this. Given the incredibly high prevalence of SHBT in patients with chronic kidney disease, what further advancements or perhaps earlier interventions might be on the horizon, thinking beyond just managing the existing kidney disease itself? Could there be ways to prevent or significantly mitigate this parathyroid condition before surgical options even need to be considered? It feels like a complex but really vital question, and one certainly worth continuing to explore as medical science keeps advancing.